Welcome to the Worldwide Teach-In on Climate and Justice. Bienvenue à la conférence mondiale éducative sur le climat et la justice. Bem-vindo ao encontro participativo global sobre clima e justiça. Today we are coming together globally to share our concern for the climate crisis, for climate justice, and to find solutions. We understand that carbon pollution is causing the planet to heat up. We see the fires and floods, the droughts and crop failures. This teaching will help us all move from despair about this to determination together to change the future. Why climate and justice? Global warming is profoundly unjust. People in low-income communities are already suffering the most as the planet heats up. In the last year, tens of millions of people have been forced to leave their homes by climate change, more refugees than from conflict and violence combined. We can stop this. We can stabilize the climate and in doing so, create jobs and opportunities for all in a new green economy. What will it take? Our hard work and the courage to face it. It's not really that bad. Oh yeah, it is.
Recording in progress. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, we are going to get started. We do have a busy day and lots of ideas to share. Uh, so let's get rolling. Um, so my name is Noah Fay, and on behalf of a large number of people who helped organize and pull this event off, uh, I welcome you to the Puma Community College uh, Worldwide Teach-In for Climate and Justice. And when I say worldwide, I mean that literally. There are about 300 similar events happening around the world in like 25 different languages right now. Uh, this event is organized by some folks at Bard College in New York, basically provide us the idea and the infrastructure to do this. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of action and ideas being shared right now today, and we're a big part of that. Um, it's really important to note that we have participation in this event from the entire Pima community. We have students, faculty, staff, administrators who helped organize, who are panelists, moderators. We have a number of outside organizations who are, who are here. That's really encouraging. One of the biggest problems we had in organizing this was the outpouring of interest in participating to the point where we had to come up with creative ways of fitting all that interest in in the three hour time window that we had. It's a really good problem to have and really speaks to the, the interest in the community in helping solve this problem. So when I teach climate change in my geology classes, we get into some of the nitty gritty aspects of climate science, but there's also two other sort of general things which I emphasize, which is really relevant here. One is that the atmosphere is a really well-mixed thing, meaning if you go outside and you put something into the atmosphere in any one spot, in about two weeks, it's spread around the world roughly evenly. That means that this problem, that cl climate change, is a global problem, which is different from a lot of other environmental problems. Most of those, if we think of an oil spill, is fairly localized to the spot where it happened. Climate change is a whole different can of worms because of the global well-mixed nature of the atmosphere. And so it's important to know that one person's actions in Tucson are just the same and just as important as another person's actions on the other side of the world. We have to do this together on the size, the scale of a, of a community college, of a city, of a country, et cetera. The other thing that I like to remind people is that we've been here before. We've solved this kind of problem before. The 1987 Montreal Protocol, which is an international treaty to slowly phase out certain chemicals released into the atmosphere, which have caused harm to the atmosphere. I'm sure you've heard of the ozone hole or depletion of the ozone layer. This treaty successfully, we, uh, we sort of collectively agreed to stop using those chemicals, and it worked. The problem that they were causing has slowly healed itself, so to speak. Now we should recognize that climate change is similar in that it's related to the atmosphere, but it's a much larger problem. But nonetheless, we have the blueprint, we have the, the sort of history built into ourselves in order to a way to solve this problem. And I think that provides some realistic optimism um, going forward. So I'm gonna talk very quickly about the logistics for the event. Most importantly, this is a participatory event. This is not meant to be a series of lectures. It's meant to be a conversation between panelists, the audience, and everyone involved. And so we encourage slash expect questions and comments from the audience. For those of you that are in the room, there are two microphones on either side of the room. That is the best way for you to participate. Importantly, because this is being broadcast, and so we really need voices to go in the microphones in order for that to go out into the world. Um, and so please make your way there, um, both during the presentations and after. Um, for those of you who are connecting to us via the Zoom feed, uh, the usual requests, please keep your microphone muted. If you have a headset at home that you can put on right now, that would really help with potential feedback problems, and if you'd like to make a comment, question, et cetera, just push the raise hand button and we'll get to you as soon as possible. Please note for the Zoom folks also that we have someone monitoring the Zoom call. If there is some feedback issue, they're gonna mute your mic just to make sure that that doesn't 
get out of control, and then you can turn it back on later. For those of you connecting by way of the live stream, the YouTube live stream, uh, we can't see or hear you, of course, uh, but we really want your participation as well, and that you can do by way of the chat. You can put comments, questions in the chat. We have someone in the room who's monitoring the chat, and we will move your question into the, into the room here right away. One other little housekeeping note is the live stream. There's a short delay between five and 10 seconds, probably not enough to, to matter, but just know that there's that short delay uh, depending on your internet connection. All right, so in terms of the schedule, we have three panels. Each of them is about 45 minutes. Roughly half of that will be presentations. The other half is dedicated to questions, answers, comments, et cetera. Um, we have two panels back to back, a short break, a short video, and then our third panel, and then we'll be done. We're gonna start with some introductory comments by the chancellor and the mayor. Uh, and so, Chancellor Lambert, uh, you're up. Thank you, Noah, and good morning, everybody, and welcome to uh, today's uh, teach-in on climate, and, and we also like to add the social justice component into to the conversations. Uh, before I begin, I, I just want to acknowledge uh, a few individuals uh, who are in the room as well as who might be on the other side of the cameras. First and foremost, I want to thank our governing board for their support of the college's vision. A key component of that is rooted in five gaps. One of those gaps is sustainability. Uh, also, I wanna acknowledge Congressman Grijalva will be joining us a little later this morning. And we have with us this morning, Mayor Romero. Thank you, Mayor, for being here. Um, also, I just wanna acknowledge that we have one of your staff who will also be uh, joining us today, uh, your key advisor on environmental and sustainability, Fatima Luna. Also want to recognize uh, uh, Trevor Ledbetter, who's from, he's the director of the UA Office of Sustainability, University of Arizona. And also Edward Bayshore of the Greater Tucson Chapter of the Citizens Climate Lobby. Also want to thank our, our faculty, our staff, administration, and our students for what you do to help support uh, sustainability, addressing climate, and social justice at Pima Community College and the greater community. Um, so one of the things that Pima is really focused on as we go forward into the future is developing a climate action plan. And we're going to take our climate action plan and integrate it with the work we're doing around social justice. But some of the key pieces that will be part of that plan will include uh, focusing on construction and renovation projects and how we can reduce energy consumption, uh, reducing energy use in our buildings and make things more efficient from a maintenance and operations standpoint, evaluate solar energy uh, throughout the district, uh, also look at obtaining more of our energy from non-grid renewable resources and many other components. So I just want you to know those are going to be some of the elements that will go into the, to the work of our plan. Also, I wanted to highlight just a, a couple of initiatives that we have already underway. Uh, I always like the John Lennon quote, right? So he basically said, you know, life happens when you're, when you're making plans. Well, we can't wait for the plan. There are things we know we need to do, and we, need, and we are doing them now. So according to Architecture 2030, citing to the Global ABC Global Status Report of 2018, concluded that 28% of annual global CO2 admissions comes from building operations and 11% comes from building materials and construction. Why is this important? Because Pima Community College has just launched into a partnership with train company, and many of you are familiar with, with train company, over 50% of all HVA systems and buildings across the, the country our trained products. And so we have partnered with them to launch the very first ever, we believe it's the very first ever in the country, virtual learning living lab. And so what that means is we're gonna be leveraging what they call the digital twin technology to create a, and IBM, I'll use IBM's definition just so for those of you who are not familiar with the digital twin model, 
It is a virtual model that accurately depicts a physical object. So we're going to build this virtual living lab that depicts the entire college physical assets. And then we're going to go a step further. We're going to use that to link it to the academic side of the college to train and educate today's and tomorrow's future HVAC technicians. And a critical part of that is going to be the data analytics. That certification has already been developed by train and will be deployed by our faculty here who have been part of the work with train company. So we're very excited about this. This is first ever going on in the country in the community college space, maybe even in the university space as well. So Mayor, I just want you to know that you know, we're trying to do our part. Also, we are partnering with you on your One Million Trees initiative. I'm sorry we couldn't do our co-tree planting here in front of the automotive building. Uh, a lot had to do with COVID, as we all know. But we're continuing to partner with the city, and we will continue to look at how we can align our plans to continue to do more and more. So those are just two of the many things that we have going on at Pima Community College to really highlight and demonstrate our commitment uh, to, to climate. But again, it's not just climate. It's about social justice and understanding that these two intersect. And these are not just local issues or statewide issues or United States issues. These are global issues. And so I'm so pleased that we are on the forefront of doing our part in this community together. Also, I want to just acknowledge, and I, and I should have said this at the outset, this event is taking place on the ancestral lands of the Tohono O'odham Nation and the Pasquayaki people. It's easy to acknowledge, but what's more important is what are you doing? And so I just want to just quickly touch on uh, two pieces. If some of you may be aware, Pima Community College played a key role in helping the Tohono O'odham Nation launch their own community college. Also, we are involved in an exciting uh, project with uh, the Pasquayaki tribe to train emergency medical professionals. Uh, and so we've been doing that for a few years. Those are just a few of the many things we're doing with our local tribes. But I just want you to know Pima is not just about the rhetoric. It's about the action. In the end, it's about the action. Uh, and I'm so pleased that we are doing that. So with that, just thank you all for being here this morning. This is an exciting event for us. And we look forward to just building off our collective wisdom as we do more and better for our community. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chancellor. Um, another important theme discussed in class that uh, is that individual actions matter, but they matter a whole lot more when implemented through policy. And so I'm really thrilled that we have local government representation through the mayor's office and through Grijalba here um, who are in a position to implement such policy. So Mayor Romero, please. Buenos dias. Muy buenos dias a todos. Muchas gracias por venir. Good morning. Thank you all for coming. First and most importantly, I would like to thank the organizers. I know that um, faculty, staff, and students were involved in coordinating this teach-in, and so I want to uh, thank you all uh, for really getting Pima College and its ecosystem into this conversation. It's an important one to have. Um, frankly, I think we, um, our timeline is running late <laughs> in terms of the work that we should be doing for climate change and uh, climate adaptation, but um, it is never too late to uh, move fast and furiously to um, answers on, on our sustainability and adapting to climate change and stop contributing to greenhouse gas emissions, which is what has us here to begin with. Um, Chancellor Lambert, thank you so much for the, uh, for the opportunity to work with you and partner with Pima Community College. I am an alumna of Pima College and uh, understand how important Pima is for our community, for economic development, and for the future of our students and the workforce in the city of Tucson. It's an honor to be here today. 
and to share this virtual space with people, I'm sure, around the country and around the world in uh, this call to action uh, from particularly young people. Thank you, uh, Chancellor Lambert, for acknowledging that we are on ancestral lands of the Tohono O'odham people and the Pascuayaki people who have stewarded these lands since time immemorial. I want to um, especially want to welcome the students, the students in attendance here um, and those that are uh, attending virtually for really being the leaders on fighting for climate justice and, uh, and really bringing to the forefront what climate change means to all of us. So your voices are necessary and um, are really leading us into the future. You know, I, I grew up in a small farm working town, Somerton, Arizona, it was along the US-Mexico border. Uh, the risks of extreme heat and other climate hazards um, have always been on my mind as I saw my father and my mother and my sisters and brother and myself <laughs> working on the fields, uh, our neighbors working in the fields. I know what heat is when people are working outdoors. And, um, you know, I've always been conscious about what our climate is and, and what it does uh, for our communities. My father, uh, Jose Romero, um, taught me to love nature and protect it. He believed that nature reciprocates what we humans give. Uh, if we protect nature, she will nurture us. If we exploit it, she will have nothing else to give. So my father really was an environmentalist and a conservationist without him even knowing or self-proclaiming. Um, he is the reason why I dedicated my career to advocate for justice, um, immigrant rights, worker rights, and our environment. Um, first as a council member and now as the first Latina mayor of Tucson. Every corner of the world has been affected by climate change and frontline communities especially are impacted first and worst. Tucson is no different. We are the third fastest warming city in the United States. Let me repeat that. Tucson is the third fastest warming city in the United States. We follow Phoenix. So Arizona has two of the fastest warming cities in the country. A lot of people ask me why I focus on climate change and resiliency, and this is why. And so we have to act, like I said earlier, fast and furiously. And we have to commit to becoming a carbon neutral city. The mayor and council acted in 2020 on a climate emergency, and our commitment to Tucsonans is that we are going to become a carbon neutral city by 2030 and a zero waste city by 2050. As we transition away from fossil fuels and accelerate the deployment of clean, renewal, renewable and locally sor sourced energy, we also have to commit to becoming a climate resilient city. Through increased tree cover, which includes our million trees uh, for Tucson by 2030 campaign, and we also, as a community and as a city, are renowned for water stewardship and management practices. The city of Tucson has led in, in water stewardship and management practices for at least 30 years. Climate action is compatible with thriving economies. Having healthy ecosystems and a climate resilient community benefits everyone. There can be no growth without water. There is no tourism without pristine landscapes and wildlife. There is no health without clean air, and there is no economic opportunities without people. Finally, black, indigenous, and people of color 
have historically faced environmental injustice, including polluted water, poor air quality, low tree canopy, heat-stressed neighborhoods, amongst other conditions that negatively affect their health. Environmental injustice and climate change are a threat to public health, to our environment, to our economy, and to our way of life. We all have a role to play on climate, from governments to businesses, to colleges, to corporations, and to citizens like you, students from ac across the globe. Our collective effort can have significant impacts on this and future generations. There is power in community, and there is power in unity. Thank you for making people-centered climate action a worldwide priority. And thank you, Pima College, as you continue to inspire and push all of us now and into the future. Thank you all so much for, um, for having this today, for joining the conversation, for wanting to have a climate strategy for Pima College. You're all a very important part of the city of Tucson, and I'm looking forward to continued partnership with all of you. Have a wonderful discussion today, and I hope that you set tons of goals for the chancellor and our governing board members uh, to step up to. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Romero. We are gonna start right into our first panel, uh, which has two moderators, Charlie McCabe and Ashley Contreras. They will be interested in introducing the panelists, but if you are panelists in the first group, please make your way up to the front. Just another reminder for those in the audience, whether in the room or in the Zoom or at home via the live stream, that this is a participatory event. We need your input, your questions. In fact, we got a question, which is a very excellent general question, which we will be addressing throughout the day, is how can we improve climate change around the world? That's what we're here to talk about, and we're going to get started in a minute. All right, I'll get out of the way. Good morning. And thank you, uh, Chancellor Lambert and Mayor Romero, who's an inspirational uh, talks that you gave. I appreciate it. Um, on behalf of fe my fellow panelists and my co-moderator, Ashley Contreras, it's my privilege to welcome you to panel discussion number one of the Worldwide Teaching for Climate and Justice. Our session's entitled Climate Change Awareness, Impacts, and Actions. My name is Charlie McCabe, and I teach geography at Pima College. And I'm also part of Pima... Pima's uh, climate planning team. With me today are some remote, some here, uh, Fatima Luna, the mayor's environmental and sustainability advisor, um, Jamie Galeda uh, from Tucson Water, Rocky Beyer from Sustainable Tucson, uh, multimedia artist and writer and Pima instructor Jonathan Marquis, and uh, Pima College student Oscar Harper. Um, for those watching this event, and certainly for uh, the participants, there is no need to make you aware um, that our unfolding climate crisis uh, represents a grave threat to our precious planet. As recent reports from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change make clear, quote, it, it is unequivocal that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, ocean, and land, unquote. Moreover, the most severe impacts are already being felt by the marginalized members of society here at home and by those in the developing world who bear the least responsibility for the changes we are witnessing. We are all familiar with the problem. So what can we do? How do we mobilize support to combat climate change? What actions can be identified to mitigate current and future impacts? It's a tall order for the 30 minutes we have. But, so let's get to it. Uh, panelists, please remember you have just five minutes for your presentations. And uh, with that, I'll turn things over to Ashley Contreras. Thank you. 
Hello, Pima Community College. My name is Ashley Contreras. I am a Pima Community College student. Um, and today I felt the desire to participate in this teach-in because the environment is very important to me. I am a Tucson native and I feel that it's very important that we have conversations and awareness around this. This affects everybody. This doesn't matter if you're young, old, where you live, this is gonna affect everyone. And I feel that we all have a responsibility being here on this earth to make an impact. Everything that you do, big or small, is gonna help slow down climate change. And this is very important. And I just wanted to you know, thank the college for even giving us this opportunity to voice our opinions on this. And I just wanted to say thank you to the mayor and to the chancellor. Um, and I just wanted to, again, say it's a very important topic and I hope that we can raise awareness and action um, going forward. And with that being said, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Fatima Luna. She is our environmental and sustainability advisor for mayor of Tucson, Regina Romero. She formerly worked as an environment and natural resource economist for the Sonoran Institute. She will talk about climate action and sustainability. Morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Can you all hear me okay? Yes, we can. Perfect. Just checking. Thank you so much for the introduction and for creating this space to share and learn from each other. Um, I will not uh, repeat what already has been said about the climate crisis. Uh, what I want to focus on is on the actions that um, the city of Tucson, mayor and council have been taking to address the climate crisis and its disproportionate impact on frontline communities. Um, starting with what uh, Mayor Romero mentioned, uh, the city council adopted a climate emergency declaration that has become the foundation for policy making and um, the creation of programs that would help the city uh, achieve its carbon neutrality goal by 2030. Um, as one of the biggest contributors of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, transportation is an important strategy to advance carbon neutrality. And for that reason, um, and also in anticipation of uh, federal investments, Tucson Mayor and Council adopted an electric vehicle readiness roadmap to accelerate the electrification of the city's fleet and also the adoption of EVs in the larger Tucson community. And Tucson became the first public transit company in Arizona to launch fully electric buses for six uh, route um, service. We currently have five electric buses. We ordered five more and have applied for uh, another five. Um, and this is an ongoing um, strategy. Uh, Mayor and Council also changed the international, international residential code to require all new residential buildings to be EV ready and a similar code amendment would be adopted hopefully in the next month for multifamily and commercial buildings. We are also partnering up with our local utilities and local businesses to increase the network of charging uh, stations in town. And the city is completing the, uh, its fleet uh, transition plan to begin replacing old um, light duty vehicles to EVs. Um, we also know that waste uh, management is a key component of climate action as landfills produce about 15% of human-related methane emissions in the U.S. And for that reason, the Climate Emergency Declaration commits the city to become zero waste by 2050. And um, the city is developing the Zero Waste Roadmap um, to achieve this goal and as one of the first strategies Mayor and Council have renamed the landfill to uh, Los Reales Sustainability Campus to begin changing the, um, you know, the way we see and perceive uh, waste from a hazard to an asset. 
the sustainability campus will become an innovation hub for circular economy practices to divert waste, uh, keep reusing materials and products, and um, also regenerate natural resources. We, um, as a desert city, uh, extreme heat is one of the biggest hazards that we face. And we are taking a nature-based climate approach to address extreme heat through Mayor Romero's Tucson Million Trees Initiative to plant 1 million trees by 2030, uh, while systemically focusing and investing on vulnerable communities and low-income neighborhoods in Tucson. Um, trees um, not only beautify our city, but they also cool our neighborhoods, they reduce energy bills for families, and they sequester carbon. With partners and um, the Tucson Million Trees has planted or distributed over 40,000 trees uh, in the last two years, and this is in the midst of a pandemic. Um, however, uh, planting trees is not enough. As a desert city, we also need to plant water. Through the Storm to Shade program, the city of Tucson, excuse me, the city of Tucson is multi-stacking functions by diverting storm, storm water uh, to grow trees and other vegetation while at the same time addressing floating issues, filtering storm water and cooling um, our spaces. Um, the climate emergency also outlines decarbonization and the use of clean, renewable and locally sourced energy as a key climate strategy. Um, we are a solar city. We have a solar American city designation and Tucson currently produces about 25% of its energy through solar panels. And there is significant opportunity to increase this percentage as the technology is becoming more and more affordable. Um, and of course, we're also taking steps to reduce the city's overall energy demand. Uh, the city has conducted energy retrofits instead of uh, several uh, city buildings, which has increased our energy efficiency and resulted in significant savings. And lastly, we are also in the process of developing a citywide climate action plan to outline the most equitable, cost effective, and impactful pathway to achieve carbon neutrality by 2030. Um, the plan will be people-centered with a strong component on community engagement. And to date, um, several uh, survey, um, a survey, several uh, climate listening sessions have been um, uh, implemented, reaching out to over 4,000 community members. In addition, engagement strategies, um, such as public meetings, pop-up events, uh, promotora, uh, using the promotora model, uh, will be carried out throughout this year, and we expect to complete this plan by the end of the year. Um, however, uh, mayor and council and city departments will continue to implement climate action programs throughout the year uh, to act as we plan um, the ongoing climate action initiatives, programs, and policies, as well as the planning uh, is making Tucson a climate leader in uh, Southern Arizona. Fatima, and I'm sorry, I'll, we'll have I'll to move there. on to, to the next speaker uh, in the interest of time. Thanks very much. I apologize for cutting people off, but if we're going to get everybody in, we're going to have to limit our discussions to five minutes apiece. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Uh, Jamie Galeda, who's the lead planner for Tucson Waters Public Information and Conservation Office. Formerly worked, at, uh, she formerly worked as a sustainability policy advisor in the mayor's office, and as a research project manager for the U of A. Uh, it's all yours. Thanks, Charlie. And thanks, Fatima. My uh, talk really segues nicely into where she left off with the uh, Mayor Romero's Climate Adaptation and Action Plan. Uh, Tucson Water, a proud department of the city of Tucson, is partnering with the mayor's office to support the climate plan with a uh, one water master plan that looks at our water supply and demand out to the year 2100. So what we're doing with this, and um, I'm not sure if we can show the slides. Okay, great. Yeah, yet. no worries. <laughs> There's a graphic that shows. There we go. Great. 
So there, here's Fatima's uh, roadmap to support the Climate Action Plan. And where she left off with an overview of the plan, um, I'd like to move into the water component um, and how our master plan is going to support the mayor's climate plan. So we have a one water wheel on the next slide and it shows Tucson Water's water resource portfolio. So one of our most important resilience strategies for water in Tucson is diversifying our water supply portfolio. At one point, we were the largest city in the country, completely dependent on groundwater, and now we have four different water resources. Can they advance it? Just one slide. There we go. So uh, we have surface water. This is our Colorado River water uh, that comes to Tucson from the Central Arizona project. Uh, we have recycled water in our community. Tucson was one of the first cities in the country to uh, recycle wastewater and produce reclaimed water that we use to irrigate large turf, uh, like at schools and golf courses. As Fatima mentioned, we're also harvesting rain and storm water. So we have a rainwater harvesting rebate for residential customers. And now we have the green storm water fund that mayor and council approved right before the pandemic that allows us to harvest stormwater at the neighborhood scale. And then groundwater, our historic supply that we've moved away from thanks to adding these other water resources. So managing these water resources in an integrated way is known as the one water approach and it's the new paradigm for water management uh, internationally. Our plan uses that framework, and uh, what we've been doing for the past few years is an existing conditions analysis that has looked at climate impacts on water. Here in Tucson, we have to worry about climate impacts not only locally, but also in the Colorado River watershed, because that's where our drinking water comes from. Uh, we've done a greenhouse gas inventory. We are supplying that information to the mayor's climate plan. We have done scenario planning with a group of stakeholders and we will take that to the broader public, our entire customer base this year. And we have done an emergency preparedness and risk analysis that we've also shared with the mayor's climate plan. So moving into this year, what you'll see from us is this broad public engagement campaign and we will be looking for you at community events, but we will also be doing online surveys um, this will be much like uh, the Department of Transportation and Mobility's Move Tucson plan, which started right at the beginning of the pandemic, which some of you might have engaged with. This is the best way for you to tell us what you're concerned about regarding water supply and demand in our, in our community out to the year 2100. So we hope to hear from you at those events and through those surveys. We're gonna be consistent across the city and use all of our um, departments to, to really say what we're doing with respect to resilience and climate adaptation. And the outcomes of this plan will be prioritizing mitigation strategies and, take, and then incorporating those into our capital improvement program, which is the place where the projects get funded. So we're gonna make sure we're consistent with the mayor's climate plan and then carry that into our capital improvement program and make sure we're building projects correctly to help ensure a sustainable water supply out to the year 2100. That's our one water plan. Thanks very much. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Ann Browning Aiden. Uh, Pima Community College instructor. She currently teaches anthropology at, uh, and has over three decades been te teaching experience in anthropology and writing with a particular interest in Hispanic, Native American, and uh, the West and West and East Asian cultures. Thank you, Anne. Go ahead. All right. Hello, everybody. Um, students, and I consider all of us learners. Uh, in terms of facing this uh, huge traumatic situation that we are in at this point. And uh, if you can put that uh, first slide up, I'd like to use that as a talking point. Okay, a little further, there we go. Okay, um, as 
an anthropologist, um, I work with communities as well as students, but um, certainly a lot of field work, both for UNESCO and for the state of Arizona, especially communities concerned with the impacts of drought and uh, decreasing water supply. But um, there are still people who uh, ask, well, is this really happening? And so I wanted to share with you um, really the situation with us as humans from this perspective of geologic or deep time. And so um, I show this to my students and to anyone who uh, is curious or even perhaps doubtful of the uh, present situation that uh, we started out here way down uh, at the bottom and we began to impact the environment in terms of our use of fire and meat eating, which in turn enlarged or helped enlarge our brains. Much later, we uh, moved out of Africa, although not everyone did. Um, and as a result of moving in to various spots around the world, um, we impacted megafauna like uh, we, we have a, a picture uh, representative here. So we've been impacting the environment, perhaps modestly, but more and more as time goes on. Um, farming with its requirements, especially for water and land clearing and the use of pesticides uh, also impacted our environment. And so uh, people like um, Jared Diamond uh, question, well, we have obviously so, mu so many benefits in terms of farming uh, to provide us for food. And yet at the same time, um, we have been experiencing a lot of the impacts of increased population living in cities. Um, Tucson being one of the examples uh, from way back in terms of archeology. span um, And then we move on. We know that Arizona is involved in mining. And in fact, uh, I am married to a geologist who has worked in um, the mines here in Arizona. And so I am aware how they uh, also impact our environment and potentially our climate. And then we have, of course, the more massive human impact uh, with uh, the European exploration and conquest of the Americas, but uh, not just of the Americas, also much else in the world. And with that, uh, sometimes not only the exploitation of the environment, but of peoples as well. Then with the Industrial Revolution, we get a big, big boost in the impact we have on the environment. And with um, the use of atomic bombs, uh, we hit a period uh, called the Great Acceleration. And, and you've so got about 30 are, seconds left, uh, okay. It now at uh, a juncture that can go three different ways. And so, uh, it is real, it is there, and I'd like to shift to the other slide, please. Okay, one of the other things that I do with both my students and people in communities, whether through UNESCO or here in uh, Arizona, is look at uh, groups that have been traditionally marginalized, uh, marginalized by uh, social uh, standards, uh, attitudes, power relationships, discrimination, exclusion, and inequality. And, and can you uh, can you wrap things up? Uh, we need to move yes. on to the next speaker. Okay, and this is just one example that was published here 
in Arizona, but extends to tribes throughout the United States as one example of uh, the impacts of climate change on a marginalized population. And you can see around the circle that there are a lot of things going on and that tribes are uh, trying to adjust, uh, acclimate and adapt to these changes and to ensure their survivability and sustainability. And that's all. Thanks very much. Before we move on to our next speaker, we have some questions from the audience. Um, for Jamie, uh, how sustainable, I'm sorry, <clears throat> with evaporation and water use, how long can we rely on the Colorado River? So right now, we use less water in Tucson than we bring in from the Colorado. So every year, we save a third of the water that uh, we get delivered through the Central Arizona project. Um, there is, uh, there are efforts underway to control the amount of evaporation that takes place in the canal and in our recharge basins. So west of town in Aver Valley, uh, mayor and council have bought up acres and acres of farmland, retired those groundwater rights, and then we use that land to put the um, cap water into the ground and recharge our aquifer. So that water infiltrates very quickly because of the type of soils out there, which also reduces the amount lost to evaporation. So as long as we can continue to manage our demand as a community and save water, that will help with our water resilience. Our projections right now show that we will continue to save water even with population growth and development out into um, the 2050s. And then uh, we will start using those saved credits from the Colorado River out beyond our 2100 uh, uh, planning time frame for the One Water 2100 master plan. So Colorado River water, despite the fact that it's being reduced uh, because of drought and evaporating as it comes down the river and through the canal, we're still using that resource out to the year 2100 and probably beyond because we'll be, be doing such a good job managing our water demands. Like so many problems associated with climate change, the worst impacts are perhaps decades or even a century into the future, but what we do now is important in making sure that there is that future. I would like to introduce our next speaker, Oscar Harper. He's a Pima student and translator. Oscar will be discussing spaceship, earth, and natural resources. Hi, uh, not your typical student, but like uh, Mayor Romero put it very wisely, never too late. So um, why should you care for the environment? What you do personally, what you do locally, has a global impact. In caring for your immediate environment, you are creating the basis for an ecological system where each part is deeply valued and imp as an important portion of the overall planet. C, we are interconnected. Whether we choose to reuse or recycle a container affects whether a mining company exploits a mountain region in another continent. For a long, for a long time, careless personal choices have resulted in humans having committed many harmful actions against nature. In a very greedy way, consuming more than we need has wasted precious resources and left behind damaging waste. This has resulted in atmospheric pollutants, dangerous residues, increased global temperatures, rising sea levels, extreme weather events, water contamination, water scarcity, soil and water acidification, and an overall loss of biodiversity just to name a few. 
This widespread environmental degradation doesn't hurt what lives in the forest or in the ocean only. As creatures of this world, it hurts us humans too. Collectively, we live in cities, many of which are overcrowded, plagued with pollution, turned into nothing more than a jungle of cement and asphalt. Those who traditionally rely on environmental and environment for survival, like fishermen and farmers, are finding it more difficult to support themselves. And in areas where precious metals and oil uh, are found, locals are often exploited by multinational corporations, sometimes even expelled from their land. As a Catholic who understands the importance of protecting the environment, I am very happy to hear the Pope say, we are meant to be among and for creation as its caretaker, not above it as its Lord. Humanity has never been given unlimited authority to do whatever it pleased with the, with the earth. The earth is a gift, a gift meant for all to be cared by all. The resources of the earth should be properly respected in their own right. Our immense technological development has not been accompanied by a development in human responsibility, values, and conscience. I urge you to think about the Earth as if it were a spaceship traveling about 67,000 miles per hour in space. And we, and all the creatures, are the passengers. The spaceship has limited supply of water, air to breathe, and a built-in mechanism to clean it. And it must haul all of its waste. There is no dumping station. This is how you can help uh, uh, protect the water, protect the air, protect the trees, and clean the air and reduce the waste. One of the most important things that we can do is up there, vote. Let's make sure that we put people in, 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 in uh, in charge that understand this problem and are willing to work to solve it. The other way that we vote is every day when we make purchases. Let's think what it is that we're getting. Are we accepting the plastic container? What am I going to do with the plastic container after I use the product I bought? Is there another option? Can I do without? Companies are blamed for doing things uh, like contaminating and polluting, but they are responding to our request. When I buy a company's product, I am encouraging them to produce more of that same product. So I'm to blame for what they do. Thank you. I, I'm sorry to stop you, Oscar, there. You were on a roll, but no, unfortunately, okay. we have to move on. And I'd like to invite you to take my classes. Uh, <laughs> Our next speaker is uh, Jonathan Marquis, uh, who's a Pima College art instructor as well as a multimedia artist and writer, um, landscape investigator and documenter. Uh, he'll be discussing drawing ice. Tess, this works here? Very good. Um, it's so grateful to uh, be here with all you and all these very uh, wonderful uh, other presenters, so thank you for having me. Um, again, my name is Jonathan Marquis. I'm a uh, multimedia artist and educator here in Tucson. I teach at Pima and U of A. And I'm here to talk about my artwork and glaciers. Yes, that's about ice in the desert. Uh, glaciers have been described as the canary of the coal mine of global warming. Various scientists and artists are documenting glacial melt across the globe, proving that glaciers are melting at a rapid rate. High alpine ice and snow are crucial to the ecosystems of all living beings, including us here in Arizona. Is it not the ice and snow melt in Colorado that provides our state with water? I am deeply curious about the ecological interconnections we live in uh, and are dependent upon. I invest my time hiking, exploring, and learning about the natural network that we as humans inhabit and make home within. 
I believe we can hear all the climate facts, visualize the wildest apocalyptic scenarios, create paralyzing narratives of loss, but until we grant the living world around us the same care and excitement that we afford ourselves, we are just spinning tires. In 2014, I lived in Missoula, Montana, and I began a project to draw every glacier in the state. I aptly called it the Glacier Drawing Project. I quit my day job and I launched the project on Kickstarter. Since then, I have walked thousands of miles uh, to visit glaciers in isolated locations across Montana. My goal with the project is to bear witness and give attention to glaciers as they disappear. I want to create interest and cultivate empathy for these fragile places. Through the project, I spent countless hours walking to, on, and around glaciers, drawing, looking, reading, and thinking about them. Sitting on the rugged terrain and drawing for long periods of time, a question kept gnawing at me. I could see the marks glaciers made on rocks, rocks newly exposed from the retreating ice that haven't felt the warmth of sunlight in thousands of years. I could see the shapes glaciers carved from the mountains, and that question kept grinding away at me, gnawing deep into my belly, just like ice chews up rocks. The question is, does a glacier draw? I often, I often ask my students, what is drawing? I ask that question to you here today, what is drawing? At the essence, drawing is mark making, marks made onto a surface. And here at a glacier, all over the rocks, are all sorts of marks. You can see it in the bottom right slide there. So, can a glacier draw? I'm not sure I've ever really been interested in providing a definitive answer to that question, but in just holding the question itself provides new ways to think about and relate to a glacier. It transform the, transforms the glacier from mere object of scientific study, feature on a map, or place to escape to for adventures into a creative entity whose life and death are intimately entangled with the construction and sustainability of our own. You can advance the slide, please. With this realization, I introduced a new technique to my newly made ice friends, cyanotype. Cyanotype is a photographic medium receptive to light and material encounters. It is how blueprints were made, if you remember those. I began setting up cyanotypes at the foot of melting glaciers, allowing the glacial material to engage the art medium and making space for the glacier to participate in the production of its own works of art. Scientific data and thoughts about climate disaster are alone are not often enough sufficient to convey the immediacy and personal relevance of climate change. Art can help, I believe. Art is communication. It can take something as big and abstract as climate change and make it visceral. Together, the arts, sciences, activism, community planning, and innovation offer tangible ways to engage directly with the environment, to learn from it, to learn how to live with it, to create place, heal, and build community and empathy with the more than human world where we make our home. Thank you. Someone who makes friends with glaciers can always be a friend of, of mine. Uh, a reminder to the audience, if you have a question, please feel free to come up and step to the mic and we'll entertain your question. Um, our, the final uh, speaker in, in this uh, first panel is Rocky Beyer, who's representing Sustainable Tucson. Uh, she's an ambassador of sustainability and zero waste uh, committee member, and uh, she'll be talking about civic engagement and connection with her organization. And Rocky, uh, perhaps while you're speaking, you can address a question that we had from the audience. Is there a way to get information about recycling uh, out to the, the public better? I see people trying to recycle the wrong things. Cool, so um, just to quickly answer that question, I agree that there is a problem um, with recycling. I'm on the Zero Waste Committee and that is one of the things we look at. Um, I think that it's a matter of awareness. There are a lot of different 
um, projects happening right now that are trying to bring awareness to this, um, including different websites that let you know what types of things that can be recycled in different places. It's different for each place. Um, and I also think that more and more awareness has come uh, to the fact that we can't recycle everything and a lot of things that we throw away end up not being recycled. So is there another way that we can do something to, um, you know, a, a different way to either dispose of our waste or to not make waste at all? Um, so with that, I will introduce myself. So my name is Rocky Bear. I am a member of Sustainable Tucson. I've been a part of Sustainable Tucson for a little over a year now. Um, and I'm honored to follow everyone here to, who um, spoke about a lot of somewhat scary things um, and spoke with a lot of poise and grace, so I will do my best to round out this panel on a hopeful note. So uh, just a little bit about Sustainable Tucson. Um, our mission is quite simply to make Tucson sustainable or to build an equitable community in harmony with our natural and desert environment that thrives long into the future. We were founded in 2006 as a response to the Al Gore film, An Inconvenient Truth, and from there we began to do um, environmental, I mean, in, environmental educational talks to uh, share about what's going on and to get that information out there. And then we transformed into this group that also had action committees as well. So these are our action committees. Building resilience has to do with neighborhoods and empowering neighborhoods to make um, changes on the local level. Charitable and faith-based sustainability is empowering places of worship to either change their uh, facilities to be more sustainable or to take action themselves. Energy transformation is to electrify Tucson and to make it um, have renewable energy. And habitat restoration is to um, restore the natural environment as well as do other projects such as create pollinator gardens. And the Zero Waste Committee, which is my favorite, the one that I'm on, is to promote zero waste activities in Tucson, which I will talk about in the next slide. We also have training programs such as the Ambassadors. Oh, wait, sorry, go back. <laughs> we also have training programs such as the Ambassadors for Sustainability, um, which is a training program that spans about 12 to 14 weeks, and it introduces you to a lot of different types of sustainable uh, topics and the sustainable leadership training, both of these things which I have done, um, it, uh, it gives you the tools to discuss this very difficult topic which is um, you know, talking about climate change and how to lead discussions about that and take those skills into your, into, uh, your life. Um, and if you're interested, every, we have monthly meetings on the second Tuesday of each month from six to seven which, um, and you can get more information on our website. So now on this next slide. So um, I joined Sustainable Tucson because I'm, I'm a young person. I had a lot of climate anxiety and I wanted to figure out a way to do something with this energy. So one of the things that I did in this first picture here is I started, uh, I co-founded the Tucson Repair Cafe, which is a place, a free place for people to bring in their broken items to be fixed. And the goal is to reduce waste and consumption and stop the cycle of buying something, having it break, throwing it away and buying something new. So we're trying to uh, divert things from the landfill. And this is just one example of something that was just an idea. These, these exist all over the world, but we brought it here. Um, the second picture is from Shade Tucson of tree planting, and that was in conjunction with the Friends of Himmel Park and Trees for Tucson. Um, we have neighborhood meetups um, in that next picture. We do talks. The, that picture of the solar panels is agrovoltaics, which is an example of one of the things that we do um, in terms of the educational things that we do. So um, I just wanted to you know, round up this panel and say that there's a lot of bad things and I'm very aware of it. I'm sure we all are aware um, that there is a lot of negative things, but one person can make a difference um, and especially with um, when you join up with a group of people, you can make a difference. The, we built these systems, we can change these systems, and um, I encourage you to either get involved with our group or another group and uh, figure out your way to get involved and help out this crisis. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, panelists, on behalf of all of us up here. Uh, Again, we're on a tight schedule today to leave time for our other panels. So thanks very much for your kind attention. I'll turn things back over to Noah. Yeah, thank 
Uh, thank you all very much. Um, during the transition, we had one question for Jonathan specifically. Do you do climate-focused assignments with your art students? And if so, what kinds of subjects or themes do they focus on? And while you're answering, will the folks from the second panel make your way to the forward, to the front? You know, I guess I have to uh, be honest, as mostly as a uh, foundational art teacher at the 100 level here as an adjunct instructor at the uh, Pima Community College in U of A. Um, I am often trying to um, teach the foundations of drawing and art to students and am still trying to figure out ways to include um, climate-centered uh, projects um, in my classroom. Um, I know we have talked here at uh, Pima about developing a learning community with the arts and the sciences to um, better, um, better educate and engage our students from all various angles. So hopefully there's more to come here in the future. Thank you. All right, we're going to jump right into our second panel, which is moderated by Robert Foth, and who is here in person, and Maria Pereira, who is here in the cloud. Um, and they will introduce our panelists. Remember, questions are invited slash encouraged from all participants in the room and via the chat on the YouTube live stream. We do have one participant also who is here in the room. So. Thank you, Noah. So again, uh, my name is Robert Foth. I'm the Acting Dean of Mathematics here at Pima Community College. Uh, my co-moderator, uh, Maria Piero, is a Pima faculty member in astronomy and physics, and she'll be joining us virtually. Uh, on our uh, theme for today, we're here to, uh, to hear perspectives on teaching and learning about climate change uh, from both faculty and student perspectives. So on our panel, we have Sarah Jansen. She is a Pima faculty member in philosophy. Don Jest, a Pima faculty member in geology. Angelica Morales is a Pima student that has her own business, studying business, and uh, serves in the Air Force, if I got that correctly. And I believe also a, a musician. <laughs> uh, Danya Meggs is a Pima adult education faculty that's joining us virtually. And Steve Greta is a uh, Pima faculty in computer-aided drafting. Thank you. So we'll get started with uh, Sarah Jansen, our Pima philosophy faculty, on our presentation. And so again, panelists, you'll have five minutes, and we'll give you a one-minute warning to wrap up. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so excited to be here with you all today to have this important conversation. Um, today, I'm going to talk about um, some secular ethical frameworks or moral frameworks for thinking about climate change. Um, and you know, it's interesting in teaching about environmentalism and climate change and philosophy, students are often surprised that we can separate ethics from religion. Um, but interestingly, over the course of thousands of years, philosophers around the world have been engaged in that very project in developing these secular ethical frameworks um, that we can use to think about, to structure our thinking about various moral issues, in, including um, the environment and, and more recently climate change. Um, and keep in mind as I go through these that they're not mutually exclusive. They're often taught that way, um, that you need to pick one and defend your view, but um, actually they each have various strengths and weaknesses and are good in different contexts. So, um, I'll begin with talking a little bit about utilitarianism. Uh, and the basic idea behind this moral framework is that we should act in ways that maximize the interests of all sentient beings involved and minimize the suffering of all sentient beings. Um, and equity or e equality is built into this moral framework because it's important to consider the, the interests of all sentient beings involved. So this will include, include human animals and, and non-human animals, and so utilitarian, utilitarianism in particular has a rich history in the animal rights movement. Um, it's also a great moral framework for like institutional decision-making uh, 
or pu public policy or government decision making, right? Because oftentimes there's a lot of stakeholders and they all need to be equally considered. And so um, here, you know, computer science and mathematics and complex modeling of future consequences are also gonna be very important. We need to think about future generations. What are their interests? Include that in our moral calculus. So this is a great framework for thinking about what kind of consequences do we want to bring about in our world, in our environment? Right, um, A very different uh, moral framework or moral perspective is that of virtue ethics, which is on the bottom of my slide here. Arguably the oldest moral framework, you see it a lot in ancient philosophies, indigenous philosophies, where the focus is less on the consequences in the world um, and very much on the character of individuals and like what kind of character do we each want to develop in ourselves. Um, I love that Oscar touched on that, right? What kind of environmental habits can we cultivate in ourselves so that every day we're living in a mindful way? And that might be different for each of us because we're all situated differently in the world. And so this is really about moral character development and it's more focused on individual action. Whereas utilitarianism is a great uh, moral framework when we're thinking about collective action and what collective policies and actions we can take to even reverse climate change or foster environmentalism in human society. Um, so you might think of things like um, recycling, right? Composting as habits you wanna create in yourself, bringing your own utensils to gatherings, right? All of these things that take a lot of moral effort but help connect us to the environment and to our natural world in really important ways, help fo foster our value uh, of nature. And then lastly, the, the moral framework in the middle there is deontology in the middle of the slide and it, it's really focused on a good will. How do we have a good will? Um, and deontologists will say, well, it's recognizing the intrinsic moral value of other beings. And historically, that was human beings. But um, more recently, deontologists have been focusing on um, extending the sphere of moral concern to non-human animals, to things like ecosystems or even species. We're living in a time of mass extinction, so it's important to think about what the intrinsic moral value is of, of a species and species survival. And in, from a deontological, deontological, <laughs> deontologist perspective, it's important to think of these other beings as intrinsically valuable, right? They're not just for human purposes, human consumption, but they actually have lives. And it's important to think about what it is for an ecosystem to do well, independent of, of human, um, human needs and human desires. Um, so uh, almost done, next slide. Um, and so deontologists will often focus on what are the direct duties, uh, the second item there on, this, on the slide, that we have to uh, beings who have this intrinsic moral value. Um, deontologists will also and speak about indirect duties, so what duties do we have to the environment in virtue of future generations, in virtue of human beings, in virtue of children, um, we might have certain duties to the environment to preserve it, to preserve the natural world for human beings, right? And those are indirect duties we have to the environment, but we can also have those direct duties that we have to the environment just because the environment itself is uh, a nexus of moral value. Um, and I think I'm gonna end on minute. that note. <laughs> um, I already talked a little bit about collective and individual responsibility and how we, how we might navigate those with these different moral frameworks. So thank you so much. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, next we have uh, Don Jest. He is a Pima faculty in geology. Okay, hello. And Donia Meggs did not, is not coming, or not? Uh, do you know Donia Meggs? Because I know her too. She's not coming right today. Oh, she was not virtual. Well, I don't know. Oh no, I am okay. here. Oh. She's here virtually on Zoom. Oh, she is. Yeah. Oh, she's going to do a virtual. Yeah. I got it. I got it. Okay. <laughs> well, she'll she'll hear me first then. Correct. Okay. Because uh, we were both. I'm actually. Well, I am, a, I am a geology faculty, but I also am a member <clears throat> of Al Gore's Climate Reality Project. And his, he um, started, hmm, I think in about 2015, um, a, um, a project 
of teaching people about climate change, essentially. And one of the things he taught me more than anyone else, in fact, the two slides I'm showing are part of that, is to always include hope. Because I actually did a short lecture before at, at um, <clears throat> uh, Pima, Pima County uh, Parks and Recreation that I just talked about, the doom and gloom. And people were upset. I mean, they were, I mean, uh-oh, we're dead, you know. So uh, what I learned more from Al than anything else is to always end with some hope and to put that in because there is some hope, you know. <laughs> and uh, actually, I may be, I think I am going to be this summer in June. Um, I rarely go to Las Vegas, but he's doing a another training in Las Vegas, and I think I'm going to be a mentor at that. I'm probably going to do that, so I might actually get to meet him this time. But anyway, <laughs> um, that's one of the, the main things that he taught me. I mean, the whole idea is that we were going to go out to the Tucson community. We, I only did it twice before <clears throat> um, COVID hit <laughs> and uh, to give some talks. And, uh, and that, that is the idea. We are going to be doing that more. In fact, I'm going to be a, one of the heads of the Tucson chapter. Um, and we'll be doing that more as we can to try to convince skeptics that there is a problem here, you know, and then add some hope to it. <laughs> so, so um, and to show the things you can do such as going all electric, um, if, 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 you can, if you can with your vehicle, that those, all of the detailed, uh, detailed things that an individual can do. But um, these, I picked these two slides because they show hope. They were taken in um, Africa, and I don't know what village, I'm hoping that he returns or someone else. This was in 2018, so it's been almost four years. Um, and there is a village that is being taught on laptops with solar collectors right in front of them in Africa. Um, so that's a really good show of some hope. And was the other one shown already? It was also in the same village. Yeah, in the same village, those are huts, you know, that they live in, but they have solar panels and they can use some electric electricity in the middle of Africa. So um, I'm hoping that he goes back or whatever, and by the way, he personally makes sure that he's climate neutral. He has a huge uh, farm in Tennessee and um, it's, anyway, he's climate neutral in his, in his life. You know, he, if he takes a trip by the airplane, he makes sure that he's, he's balancing it <laughs> with what he does in his, in, at his farm. So um, let's see. And then I also, I also, for part of that, put together um, a um, t Tucson temperature uh, list of showing that yes, climate change does affect us here in Tucson. And up till August 2020, our highest uh, monthly was uh, 106 degrees, 107 degrees, and our highest daily temperature was 116. And I looked at just before I came here, actually yesterday, at 2021, which is during COVID. There is a good thing about COVID. It did slow climate change a bit, but not that much. John, one <laughs> in, more minute. Yeah, in yeah, 2015, we got up to 115 degrees. So that's just, that's basically it. Yeah, so, okay, thanks. Thank you, Don, for the reminder of hope as we talk about climate change. 
Uh, our next panelist is uh, Angelica Morales, one of our students here at Pima Community College. Oh, I should have said I read that wrong. In 2021, we got up to 115. <laughs> Here we are. Buenos dias. Um, I'm Angelica Morales. I'm a student. <clears throat> I'm an intelligence analyst with the Air Force, and I'm also a sustainability consultant at a Yale startup called 1.5. But most importantly, I'm Pascuayaki. Um, and as my slide says, I really just wanted to touch today on the importance of indigenous perspectives, BIPOC perspectives in general, right? Pretty much every topic that we've kind of covered this morning um, relates to indigenous culture. I mean, where did it start? That, that's where it started. And so one thing that I've been really grateful for is that in my journey, I've really been given opportunities to come speak in, in, in a certain capacity, right? Because of not necessarily a degree that I have or a career that I've had, but my lived experience as an indigenous woman, as a Latina woman. And that can be understated. Um, I think as young people especially, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, it can be intimidating, right? You, you kind of are around people who have years and years and years of experience, people that have been doing things before I was even born. But it doesn't serve to be intimidated because now is not the time. We don't have time anymore, right? I mean, that sounds depressing. Sorry, but we don't. Um, and so there's that immediate call to action. But I think what I would really, all that I can really say that hasn't been said before is that I would encourage everybody in this room who is in a position of power, who is um, you know, running a certain program or teaching a class or involved in the community in, in, a, in, a, you know, a, res in a big way, to call upon more BIPOC perspectives, um, especially when it relates to climate justice. I mean, we are the community it's affecting. It's fine and dandy to talk in theory about, oh, it's affecting these communities or it's affecting that community, but what you really need it are the people who are involved in it. Um, not for a degree, per, you know, per se, or even, uh, direct connections or anything like that, but just that lived experience. I think lived experience cannot be understated. Um, and I had those bullet points, but I wasn't really touching on anything that hasn't been said before. I would just kind of like to use my time here to just say that. Please bring more BIPOC um, experience into whatever it is you're doing. Um, yeah. Thank you. Our uh, next panelist is uh, Danya Meggs, uh, Pima faculty in adult education, and she'll be joining us through Zoom. Hi, everyone. I am Danya, and I'm really excited to be here today. I am also a member of Pima College's climate planning team and a member of Sustainable Tucson. Um, and I really encourage you to check out the work that Sustainable Tucson and other local organizations are doing because there are a lot of great avenues for involvement. Um, so I would like to um, <clears throat> uh, go to the first slide, if I may. Um, today I'd like to share a little bit about my perspective as an instructor. And I do this for two reasons. Um, I'm hoping to inspire um, the instructors who are, are um, participating today to feel more comfortable and motivated to teach climate change in your classes. Um, and also, I'm hoping to inspire the students in our classes to speak about speak out about what you need. Um, so um, I, I had changed my slides a little bit, and I, I think maybe um, this is the older version, but um, so I'm, I'm sharing what I have experienced as I've been teaching climate change in my classes over the past five years or so. Um, I have um, found some things that work and, and some things that didn't. So I thought, you know, it's great to share uh, my perspective. Uh, every class is different, but, um, 
this is what has worked for me for me in my classes. So, um, and just a word about why this is so important. Um, our students are largely either BIPOC or lower income, and therefore among those most impacted by climate change. And I feel a real responsibility to try to empower and educate my students on this topic because we need their leadership uh, within their own communities and within Tucson at large. They are a really crucial part of the solution. So um, that's why I think it's so important. So um, I think it's really um, crucial to be real with our students. Um, it is a heavy topic and um, acknowledge that, be real. Um, but um, don't get bogged down. So, and also don't debate climate change. Um, I really think it's important to, pre to present the basics of the scientific method so that students know what the climate change research is based on. And in that process, you can acknowledge the role that uncertainty plays in that process so that, un that students understand it better and um, can help uh, understand the rhetoric that they're hearing about the, un the uncertainty um, because it's misinterpreted often. Also, I think it's so important to foster uh, systems thinking because we need that for um, developing adequate solutions and understanding how things are all connected. You know, um, it, we really can't solve this crisis by just thinking in pockets. So our students need those skills. But it's also important, you know, to not get bogged down in uh, all of that. Um, you try to keep things um, manageable within the classroom. But dive deeper where students connect to the issues. Um, that's where students can really get engaged. Um, perhaps focus, focusing on a regional, um, our regional water issues is a great place um, to focus as a class, but also individualized research projects have been really successful in my classes. The next slide, please. Um, it's so important that we share our personal stories as instructors. That's really motivating to students and acknowledge that we are also still learning. You know, we don't have all the answers as instructors, but we can facilitate and model the learning process and also have students share their own personal connections. Um, I've had some of the most powerful moments in my classes through students sharing about the way they have personally been impacted by climate change. And I think it's also important that we understand and be prepared for climate anxiety and grief to arise in our classes, because that is a, a very natural part of reacting to this information. And it's also important that we offer support resources for students in those areas. Um, as Don Guest alluded to before, it's so important to move quickly to hope and solutions. It's also critically important that we offer avenues for engagement and action you know, um, overwhelm and paralysis are not the answer here. We need to all find ways to get involved. And there, there are many ways to get involved and there's much reason for hope. And I think it's so important that we focus on that in our classes. Um, also, I found it really helpful to integrate this material with teaching skills explicitly in the process. And um, it's most powerful st for students Oftentimes, if this information is either connected to their personal lived experience or their career paths. So whenever we can connect it to career path, that's really helpful. And last but not least, it's so important that we create support among our colleagues for teaching climate change um, because it's a learning process and we all need resources. We need um, ways to make that more accessible to us as teachers to share it with our students. So thank you very much. Um, I hope that this has been um, helpful in some ways to both teachers and students in the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Danya. Um, 
Our next panelist is Steve Greta, uh, Pima faculty in computer-aided drafting. Good morning, everyone. So, um, and I have to say, I'm thrilled to see two of my students here. A quick shout out to them. So, um, um, I'll be talking a little bit about teaching of some of these marvelous concepts and very important strategies. And I'm going to be talking about one very specific project that was last semester. And um, one of the beautiful things about teaching is that I often do it in community. So um, this isn't anything that, that, even though it was my course, I, um, I uh, partnered with two other instructors, Rochelle Hornby, who received the United Nations Sustainability Development Goals, Goals Open Pedagogy Faculty Fellowship um, last year. And so we strategized how to bring that into one of the classes. And she's also uh, she's, uh, one of our computer-aided design instructors. The other is uh, Caroline Patrick Birdwell, who teaches GIS, Geographic Information Systems, uh, for us in the CAD department. Um, and these are marvelous beings. And we came up with a, um, a to be speaking about one specific assignment. So some of the goals, when they take the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, um, this project took a look at multiples. It was primarily about climate action, but it looked at the other goals of no poverty, good health and well-being, reduced inequities, sustainable cities and communities, and life on land. And so it had some... Um, it, it has a quite a bit of overlap. The course is about sustainable si uh, introduction to site development. And what we were looking at is one specific issue with, with this one assignment, and that is urban heat island, the effects of her urban heat island, and um, a way of mitigation, which is uh, tree coverage, canopy. And we looked at... Um, how this impacts our community itself. And we looked at two neighborhoods, one north of 22nd Street, which is the Armory Park uh, Historic District, the Armory Park neighborhood, and then the Santa Rita neighborhood south of 22nd Street. And so we did some steps. It's really helpful to have the students discover for themselves a temperature differential. And so what we did, and so maybe we can look at the next slide, is. Um, the students did first, first they did their research, and then we went and we created point data where they measured surface temperature, sun and shadow, um, by creating data points in ArcGIS. And we looked at temper, temperature differentials on sidewalk, on streets, and on um, non-paved areas, the planting strips. Um, and we found, especially on the um, asphalt blacktop, we found uh, about a, between a 30 and a 50 degree difference, maybe just four or five feet apart between sun and shade. And we did this over multiple times, so we began to kind of average some of this data, and we began to take this data to actual locations. The students can see it, feel it, experience it. And that is powerful, uh, because uh, this knowing something and feeling something um, is different. Um, so what we looked at is uh, the investigation of tree coverage, and we're able to do that through Arial, through some of the GIS tools. And then we did research on demographics, and ArcGIS is fantastic for that because we can take a look at some of the differences. We can take a look at income. Uh, we can take a look at ethnicity. We could take a look at education. We could take a look at a number of the home ownership. And we can take a look at where we have correlations between urban heat island. And let me tell you, urban heat island uh, affects um, communities of some of the lower income communities, some of the communities at risk, far more greatly than it does uh, communities that um, are more affluent, with, or, or portions of our community that are more affluent. And so we looked at this correlation. And in this correlation, it's, uh, students came up with their own, 
first research story maps, which is a way of saving this data and showing this data to interaction, and then they did presentations to the, um, to the fellow students. And what this has the potential of is, is, is becomes part of the story. And if I have a moment, I'll tell one of the stories, the student who is taking the reading up there, um, uh, Mondo, and some of you know him, um, he told a story. He grew up south of 36th Street, south Tucson. He told the story of growing up as a child. And there was a, a little triangular area of grass, and that was the only kind of grass in the neighborhood, and most of the children would play there. And he told the story of them coming and cutting the grass out, harvesting the grass out, to move it to the east side to a more affluent community, the only grass in the neighborhood. And that story, that ability to tell that story and the ability of the students to hear that story, the community hear that story, impacted us greatly. Um, he told that the um, person who was cutting the grass cried. He was also Hispanic and, and understood. And he understood the inequity and the injustice of having a cooled place to play. And it never has been returned to grass at that. <laughs> Thank you for sharing, Steve, that uh, dive into your classroom experience. Uh, so we did get a question uh, from the audience. Uh, we've already had multiple speakers, representatives from the city of Tucson talk about changes that are happening, um, but they were interested about other awareness of uh, what Tucson is doing to help with climate change. So Don, I know you had talked about speaking in public at various locations. Are you aware of uh, any other things that Tucson is doing about uh, addressing climate change? Um, boy. We, we haven't been out talking recently because of COVID, so um, I'd like ideas actually, <laughs> you know, of where to go in fact, if you have one. Sarah? I think very, very recently, the city's looking into a Norte Sude transit line, like a BRT line. So really investing in public transportation. Um, and they're soliciting actually feedback right now about how to design this line. I mean, I think it'd be nice to see it be electric personally, but um, that's the kind of feedback they're looking for. So just wanted to throw that out there. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much to the panel. Um, so you've all had an opportunity to talk in about teaching situations, uh, but one of the issues we have today in our communities is the um, a, a lot of political polarization, and so I think it's affected our ability to have conversations with our neighbors and our friends. And I was wondering if you had any insights from your own experiences, how we can improve the way we have conversations with our, our fellow community members. How do we establish a communication with them so we can talk about climate change? Because that's ultimately one of the most important ways I think that we're going to get to solutions is to be spreading that conversation around. Um, I can kind of speak to that as far as like my government position in, in intelligence community. A lot of things that we talk about are misinformation, right? When you go on Facebook or whatever and you're sharing a link, are you really checking to make sure that that's a value, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, the source is, is verified, right? And I think that's where a lot of the problems stem from. Algorithms tailor things to our preferences and it's really easy to get bogged down in that. I think it starts with the awareness, just, just making sure that before you click share, you retweet something, you repost something on your story, you share a TikTok or whatever, kind of just keeping in mind where that could come from, where it, where it may have originated. Um, but that's something that's it's a huge problem, right? Nobody really has the answer for that, but it's pretty prevalent. 
Hi. I could add a little bit to that. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Rocky. Sorry, I just wanted to uh, add to the question, um, uh, to the answer of the question of what Tucson is doing. I encourage you to look into uh, the Los Reales Sustainability Campus. Los Reales was it's a rename of the landfill. They're trying to um, do more zero waste efforts there, um, and that's something that we on the Zero Waste Committee are working on advising them. Uh, they have some plans on how to convert waste into um, electricity, um, but that's probably not, that's the solution that we don't know if we support because like we shouldn't have waste in general. Um, I also encourage you to look into um, the trees for Tucson and the, the tree planting efforts that the mayor's office is doing. So thank you. I also want to talk about a document that is available to everyone, and that's the City of Tucson Plan Tucson. It's an amazing document. I try to um, direct my students to it as much as possible because so much of this information is um, incorporated into this document, and it is clear it's an excellent document. Thank you. We had a, a, another question for our panelists. Um, this event is part of a, a worldwide teach-in for climate and justice. Uh, what aspects of climate justice are most relevant to our students in Pima County, and how can we better infuse these topics into our curriculum? So this is open to any of our, our panelist members. I guess I can speak to that again Thank as well. Um, one thing that I didn't mention in my presentation was why I wanted to kind of come and speak about climate justice and specifically encouraging BIPOC community to get involved, right, is because I think even with Steve's presentation, we saw that it's not necessarily that you need to teach a student anything. They, they know that already. They're experiencing it. I think it's more so the other way around, right? I think um, professors or even people in positions of power have a lot to learn from younger folks um, who are having these experiences. So as far as climate justice, um, I don't think we can have like, we can do any of, in, incorporate these technologies or do any of this work if we're not also conscientious of the climate justice aspect, because especially with communities of color, there's a tendency to not trust technology, right, historically. So I think, I mean, I'm not trying to harp on it, but just really kind of maybe switching the perspective and, and, and saying students don't need to be taught, maybe teachers need to be taught, <laughs> but, but yeah. I, I can agree with you more that we have to take opportunity to learn ourselves as we kind of discover new things. Um, one of the things that was brought up was about the social media aspect of learning and whether or not we share a topic. So understanding how algorithms feed that data in front of you as you're using those tools is, is kind of an important aspect. Um, anyone wanted to add on to that question? Yeah, Sarah. I think um, also just having institutional support for environmental education is really important. Maybe even um, an environmental studies certificate kind of uh, would be wonderful to have here at Pima. More interdisciplinary programs related to the environment would just be so valuable. Thank you. That's a great idea. Um, we had another question come in, and this will be our last one for the panelists. And uh, the question is, how, what is sustainability? How would you define that? Uh, from the indigenous perspective, I think, at least in our, in our, like I said, our perspective, that really comes from the concept of seventh generation, right? So for those not familiar with the concept of seventh generation, that's the idea that a lot of indigenous cultures were govern governed themselves based off the concept of we don't, or taking our government for example, we do things by four years, right? Maybe even eight years. And there's not really a, a look into who it's gonna affect 20 years down the road, 30 years down the road, seventh generation is we take, you know, the seventh generation of a family maybe, your family, whatever, how, are, how is what you're doing now going to affect them seven generations from now? So um, I think 
I mean, I think that's where a lot of the concept of sustainability came from in the first place. So maybe just kind of, that's like a good baseline, seventh generation. So marvelously articulate and something that, um, that we need to think about. From a built environment standpoint, they look at the triple bottom line, people, uh, planet, and profit. And it's that sweet spot between those three. So is something ecologically sound that would be planet? Is something in, you know, environmentally sound? Is something uh, socially, uh, the social justice comes in with the people and the impact on people, but I would extend it to other beings. And then um, profit, is it something that is sustainable financially? And, um, and uh, or economically feasible and not in the short term, but in the long term. So that's just a simple uh, t uh, statement about something that is already built in to indigenous culture. Thank you. We are out of time. And so Noah Faye is going to come up and say a few words before we go to break. Just a few words, thank you panelists and everyone for the questions. Just a note on schedule, we're gonna take a break until 11 and start back here promptly at 11. And just as an FYI on the counter, there are some reusable water bottles for you to use here or later, take one. Use it when you're riding your bike to school and work tomorrow, right? Yes, that's the right answer. Okay, see you at 11.
Welcome back. In a moment, in a few moments, we're going to start our third and final panel. Uh, but in the interim, we have a uh, about five minute video from Representative Grijalva. Um, while he's speaking, if the panelists wouldn't mind, you can slowly make your way up. Um, and once the video is over, we'll start the panel number three. First of all, let me uh, thank Pima Community College uh, for extending this opportunity uh, to welcome you to this global teaching on climate and justice. Uh, I want to thank you for attending and Pima Community College for hosting this very, very timely and urgent uh, event. Let me begin by saying that first, climate change is real. Study upon study over the last two decades, Empirical information and facts presented have told us over and over again and warned us that the impending change in our climate, caused primarily by humanity and by our total, almost total dependence on fossil fuels for our energy, is causing our, our planet to warm. And the consequences of that warming and those emissions are, can bring, are going to be dire and devastating to the planet and to its life. And so this discussion today at this teaching is vital because there is one constant that we collectively must do something to, to mitigate and to turn back and to fight climate change. And climate and justice are intertwined. They can't be separated because if we are to solve and the challenge of climate change, if we are going to turn back this very real and proven threat of climate change, and we see it every day in droughts, natural catastrophe, rising temperatures, uh, and storms across this nation, if we're going to do that, we cannot leave the majority of humanity out of the equation of solving the climate crisis. They must be part of it. Because if we don't, then we are not going to solve the problem. And second of all, people are not going to stand for it. The other issue to take into account today is the education and motivation that we, we as citizens and as residents of this country and as residents of this planet must undertake to motivate ourselves. Because 2030 is coming, is upon us already. And we must make urgent and fearless steps forward to deal with climate change. It involves policy. It involves governmental direction and investments in renewable and alternative energy so we can make the other reality, the transition away from polluting and hurtful fossil fuel uh, dependency and emissions to clean, renewable, and alternative energies. And that transition requires the support and the investment of your government, your leadership, your private enterprises. Because what's really at stake is a legacy, a legacy of life on this planet. Humanity is the cause of why we're, where we're at with this climate. And humanity is the solution. So today's uh, teaching is vital. It's important. And going forward, I'm not just a doomsday prophet about how bad the consequences are going to be, because they will be bad. If we do nothing, if we don't accept the emergency that we are confronting with climate, all of us will suffer from it. And the legacy that we will leave to the generations to come will, will be a legacy of inaction and lack of attention to the most serious challenge that we face on this planet and in this country, climate change. So please, uh, I'm so glad that you are participating. And please understand that the commitment, not only of me personally, but yourself, to fight climate change, to move this country of ours and this planet of ours in a direction of sustainability, 
and clean energy is urgent and needed now. Thank you so much, and uh, I, I hope that this teach-in will be educational, motivational, and together we can begin to pressure those that need to be pressured, decision makers, and as individuals move, move our, move our nation and move our world toward a place where we can look back at the generations that are coming and at the young people now with a sense that we did our part to try to make this life of theirs a clean life, a sustainable life, and one with quality in it. Thank you very much. All right, we are going to start our last panel for the day, and it is moderated by Nick Sleegan, a Pima student, and Emily Halverson Otts, the Dean of Sciences. And just one last reminder to the audience, your participation is key, so if you're in the room, use the mics on the side here. If you're in the live stream, put your question comments in the chat, and we will get to that as soon as we can. All right, Nick and Emily, please. Welcome and good morning. Thank you for joining us on such an important topic. And I would like each of our panelists to tell us their name and their organization as well as an identity characteristic. So I'll let Trevor begin. Can we hear me? Okay, fantastic. Uh, so uh, my name is Trevor Ledbetter and I'm the director for the Office of Sustainability at the University of Arizona and also serve on Mayor Romero's uh, Climate Adaptation Action and Adaptation Council uh, and identifying fact, what, what are you looking for? I intentionally meant to confuse you, didn't okay. I? <laughs> um, so uh, student, educator, staff, okay. you fill in the blank, I left it open. Gotcha, okay. Uh, I am a staff member at the university, um, and I'll throw in just a little, little fun fact. I very much enjoy gardening and collecting houseplants. I like the idea of the fun fact. I almost threw that out as well. <laughs> My name is Ed Bayshore. Uh, I'm a co-leader of the local chapter of Citizens Climate Lobby, and I am also a state liaison to Senator Mark Kelly uh, for my organization. Um, I'm a retired astronomer, and before I uh, started working on climate change issues, I was obsessed with uh, asteroids that might hit the Earth. So my wife has pointed out to me that I seem to be really concerned about different ways to destroy the planet, whether it be climate change or um, an asteroid hitting the planet. My name is Chin Wei Han. I teach physics at uh, West Campus. Um, so I've been teaching, well, since maybe 2016. But I've been in Pima for a long period of time. I began teaching full-time since 2002. So I was teaching technology classes, electronic classes, optics classes, and also solar installation classes. Uh, my name is Aaron. Uh, I'm a student here at Pima, and... Uh, one thing that uh, has me thinking about climate change a lot is not just the importance of the concept, but I'm like an efficiency nerd. I really enjoy like optimizing efficiency of lots of things just on my own like thoughts, but. Hello, my name is Scott Sawyer. I also teach physics at Pima Community College and I'll roll my identity into a fun fact. Yes, Noah, I did ride my bicycle here. I am a bike rider. Not only that, I moved from California about 10 years ago and I rode my bicycle from there to here. So as Noah said, I am Emily Halverson Otts and I am the Dean of Sciences. And I'm Nixon, I'm very short. <laughs> I'm one of the students here at Pima as well. I actually go to the East Campus and I major in science as well. So I'm also gonna be one of your moderators today. So it's nice to meet all of you.
All righty, we are going to begin with Trevor's presentation. All right, so I don't have any- Trevor, I'm sorry, I need to provide the theme for this session. So apparently I like interrupting you. Problem. Um, it is technical innovations in planning for the future, and planning for the future while it was last is actually where we're going to begin. So now, Trevor, go ahead. Okay. Uh, so unfortunately, I don't have any fun or interesting graphics or photos to share uh, because we are still relatively early on in our uh, process to create the university's first ever sustainability and climate action plan. So not too much to look at, but uh, quite a bit to get into there. Um, so uh, to provide a little bit of background, the Office of Sustainability at the University of Arizona has been around for uh, about 10 years. Uh, we went, we underwent quite a major reboot in 2018 uh, and have been pushing some really transformative changes to really move the needle on uh, climate action and sustainability action at the university over, over the last three, three and a half years. Um, the Office of Sustainability itself is home to the University of Arizona Compost Cats program, which does uh, both residential and commercial composting programs. Uh, the Campus Sustainability Fund, which gives out internal grants to sustainability and climate action, uh, the University of Arizona Community Garden, and a variety of other things. Uh, we were also uh, core to the conversations with Tucson Electric Power to begin purchasing 100% of the university's grid-based energy from renewable resources, and that started uh, July of last year. So um, we've been making a lot of uh, big steps in the right direction, but uh, up to now we have not had a formalized sustainability or climate action plan to guide uh, at an institutional level what are we doing and how are we doing it. And so we are now moving into that process ourselves and really trying to focus on how do we create an actionable, implementable plan and how do we start to integrate that into uh, our institutional processes around uh, strategic and capital planning to ensure that uh, we can make those big transformative leaps uh, and really move the needle on climate and sustainability. Um, we did do a little bit of work uh, back in fall with a uh, consultant on a small scale that helped to identify a foundational order of magnitude uh, of accuracy next steps about what climate action looks like for the University of Arizona and uh, just some of the more basic infrastructure overhaul that it will take uh, to move us towards carbon and climate neutrality is going to be in the range of 250 to 500 million dollars over the next 10 to 20 years. Uh, the types of investments that are required to get not only the university but us as a society to uh, climate neutrality and to really start addressing some of these systemic issues that relate to climate change, as Representative Grijalva said, also environmental justice, um, take very large investments and are going to take uh, really transformative changes to get to where we need to be. And so we're considering all of that as we move into the sustainability and climate action plan for the university and starting to build in now. Um, the foundation and the connections in order to be able to make those sorts of investments and understand that it will take that while also keeping in, in mind diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, how we make this thing accountable, transparent, all of that. Um, I'll leave off by saying, you know, uh, the University of Arizona, Pima Community College, small institutions relative to the problem of climate, uh, of the climate crisis. And so it's going to take more than what we're able to do, but as institutions of higher education, we see tomorrow's leaders, and it is incredibly important for us to not only talk the talk, but walk the walk when it comes to climate change and sustainability action, and that is what we're really trying to do uh, with our sustainability and climate action plan and really start planning for the future and figuring out how do we pay for these things, how do we ensure that it's done equitably, and uh, how do we ensure that it's not just sitting on a shelf and ends up becoming more meaningless words that, uh, you know, we end up failing our students and uh, the communities that we serve. And do we have any questions from the audience for him? No, okay. Well, then we'll move on. Um, the next person we have speaking is going to be, Ed, I'm gonna try not to butcher your last name, Ed Bashur. Um, go ahead. 
Thanks very much, Nix. Uh, appreciate it. And I, uh, my thanks to the members of the Board of Governors and Pima Community College for putting this on. Uh, it's been really great. So if we could have my first slide, please. So I'd like to just tell you a little bit about Citizens Climate Lobby first and who we are. Um, we're a national group. Actually, we're an international group. We have uh, 200,000 supporters worldwide, most of them in the United States, uh, over 590 active chapters. And here in Arizona, uh, we have 3,700 uh, supporters. Um, we are dedicated to creating political will to solve the climate crisis. Now, political will is something that we have. It's something that we have to impart to our members of Congress to let them know that we need a solution to climate change. Um, the way we do that is manifold. Uh, we, but of course, uh, the, our name says lobby, and that's what we do. That picture uh, on the right of the, of the slide there it was our last meeting in Washington in 2019 before the COVID crisis hit. And um, uh, uh, we met with over 495 offices uh, of Congress that day. Uh, so this is what we do. Uh, we are a respectful, nonpartisan, grassroots organization. Uh, we work at many levels in the community, but uh, we, you will find us at the, uh, the Festival of Books. You'll find us at uh, farmers markets. You'll find us uh, writing um, op-eds in the newspaper, uh, all to talk about our principal focus, our principal policy focus, uh, something uh, that we call carbon fee and dividend. And if you want to know more about Citizens Climate Lobby, there's a URL at the bottom of the page there, and you can uh, go there and investigate a little bit more about us. Uh, but uh, next, uh, next slide, please. So carbon fee and dividend is a, is a policy. It's a, what we think is a, an important national policy to put forward. Um, and I'm going to begin with a question. Uh, why do you think that the um, uh, demand for used Teslas has suddenly gone through the roof uh, over the last few weeks? And I'll, I'll readdress that in a second. Uh, what carbon fee and dividend begins with is putting a price on fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are responsible for 80% of the CO2 emissions that we have in our atmosphere. We simply have to begin transitioning away from them. And of course, to avoid wrecking our economy, we need to make this in a planned, gradual uh, effort. And we propose to put a fee on the carbon content in fossil fuels. Coal has much more carbon uh, than, say, oil or natural gas, so it would be more expensive on a per ton basis. That fee would be charged at the, wa the mine, the wellhead, or the border. It would be charged to those who produce the product and put it into the economy. Uh, so that would create effectively more expensive fossil fuels. But we propose to begin $15 a ton and then increase that by $10 a ton each year thereafter. Uh, that would translate to about 15 cents on a gallon of gas in the first year, 10 cents the next year after, 10 cents the near, next year after. This helps to give predictability to the price of fossil fuels, but also uh, lets folks know that the price will continue to increase as time goes on. Now the question is, what do we do with the revenue from that? We propose to return 100% of the net proceeds from that fee to the American households as a monthly dividend check. Uh, at the end of 10 years, uh, a family of four would be receiving a dividend check of about $3,000 over the course of a year. That would more than offset the cost of increased energy for them, as well as the increased cost for some of the products that they produce or that they buy that are energy intensive. The reason that we want to do that is, first of all, it's fair. Secondly, it avoids putting the burden for solving climate change on the backs of those who are least able to afford it. 60% of our economy uh, would not have increased costs for their energy or the products that they purchase, food and other manufactured products, uh, if this dividend were returned to households. Uh, but it would send a powerful message to businesses. The, the powerful message would be energy is going to get more expensive if you buy fossil fuel-based energy. But if you want to start transitioning off of it, you have time to start making plans to do so. Furthermore, it will send another message to entrepreneurs and innovators that there will be a demand for low emission sources of energy as time goes on, and it will spur additional uh, um, innovation in the economy. So uh, I'm going to close out by just say, uh, answering my own question, why did uh, the price of uh, Teslas go up so much in the last few weeks? It's because gasoline's $4 a gallon, and suddenly people realize that they need to be moving to some other source of transportation. So that is what the power of the market and the power of price can do. 
And that is why we believe carbon fee and dividend is the way to go. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ed. I want to check in with our Zoom community. Are there any questions on the Zoom community? No. Okay. So then, Chen Wei, I would like you to move forward with your presentation. Okay. Yes, my name is Chen Wei Han. Um, so, first slide. So, my question is, why are there still so much open space, open parking lots at West Campus, if you ever been to West Campus. Um, now West Campus, I think in downtown campus, were the first campuses, first few campuses getting solar installation on their parking lots. But then after they finish, um, there's still plenty of areas that has no solar. So at first I thought, okay, there's some areas that has trees, maybe they don't, didn't want to come down, cut down the trees, right? Okay, but there are other areas on West Campus, if you look, see the picture, it's wide open space, there's nothing there. And now they did install solar in a, one section of the parking lot at West Campus on the south parking, and those are tied to um, the meter on the Center for Fine Arts. And then there's another section of solar on the north parking tied to the sports and fitness building. But still, a vast area is still open. So, yeah, so then I asked the facilities manager or person, like, why is that? And next slide. And he said, well, the solar installation at Pima, entire Pima College is through power purchase agreement. So what that is is, see, the college still pays for the electric, electricity they use, okay? But they pay at a fixed rate, and that fixed rate is for 20 years to the company, whoever installed the solar. So it's turned out to be Solon and Solar City, but now Solar City, I think, is now called Tesla. Tesla, okay. So, so Pima College is paying at that rate, right? Fixed rate, so it's a good rate. That means the rate won't increase for another 20 years. But the companies who did it, well, they do it um, because they have, what? They see profit in it, all right? Now, every building on campus or any campus has a meter, and the meter, all the solar is tied to that meter to you know drive it backwards, or you can monitor how much solar is being used or how much is being generated. Okay, so now it turns out some of the meters at West Campus, their rate is, well, the rate of electricity for some of the buildings on West Campus is so cheap that Solon and Solar City sees no profit in their investment. Okay, so, so then that's why there's no solar. I mean, that's why they did not install those solar uh, on their parking lots. Um, so yeah, it sounds, you know, not so good, but, um, but see, Pima College, I see, they still can invest their own money in putting up solar um, to generate electricity, okay. So once you have the solar, say once you own the solar, say if the Pima owns the solar, well then all the electricity produced afterwards is free, essentially free to the college. Um, but right now, because, okay, all the system that's being built up at Pima College, it's, it was no cost to Pima College. So it's like Pima College leasing their space to those companies to generate electricity, okay? and the those companies, they'll fix it. If something goes wrong, they'll take care of, it, of everything. They warranty for 20 years. Now, after 20 years, well, they give it to Pima College. Then it's up to Pima College to maintain it if anything goes wrong. So that's the trade-off. Um, but, you know, I see that, yeah, a lot of campuses now, they, they do have solar, right? We see just about every campus. And, and I commend Chancellor Lambert for you know, um, the driving force and putting up solar because before he came to Pima, there was no solar parking lots on campus. Um, so, so I think it's still, you know, it's good investment to, well, if those companies don't wanna put up solar because there's no, what, profit for them to gain, 
Well, then Pima, they can put up their own money as their investment. And they will get some return, but yeah, I don't know what the rate of return is. Um, but that's up to the facility people here to determine that because I don't know the, the numbers. You know, they can tell you like how much money they're saving throughout the years with the solar being up. So Pima College is still saving money, right? Um, with all the solar installation and the companies who install them, yeah, they're earning money also. So it's a win-win situation for, for both sides. But of all the open space that we have at West Campus right now, I think you know, Pima College can, can invest some of their own money to put up solar. Okay, thanks. Henway, we have a question specifically for you. Why can't our solar and construction classes build something, such as solar panels, et cetera? You mean install some of the solar, have the classes, students install solar panels on our parking lots? So the question specifically is, why can't our solar and construction classes oh. build something? So I think what they're asking is, can they actually build our own solar in our parking lots. That's what I'm inferring. Yes, but I think it's a liability issue, okay? Because when they were putting up solar at West Campus and downtown campus, I offered to the company, say, well, I can, I'm teaching solar installation classes here, and my students can come and, you know, install the solar panels as they're, you know, as a practice for them to install solar because they're taking the classes on solar installation. But I got no answer from them. And I think it's liability because then they have to employ the students, right, pay them, and then train them, and then, then they can install solar. All right, thank you for that response, Chen Wei. I believe we have another question. We do, and this one is um, directed to Ed. So somebody is asking, um, one, of the, one of the major costs for gasoline is the taxes from the federal and the state. So they're asking basically, um, what's the offset for that equitably? Like, Let's see. We on, uh, I think we're on, okay. So uh, basically the cost for taxes uh, on gasoline here in the state of Arizona for state and federal is about 40 cents a gallon roughly. So actually it's, it's compared to the $4 a gallon, four and a half dollars a gallon we're paying, it's, it's not a whole lot. Um, as I'm not quite sure I understand the question with regard to offset, but, uh, uh, but certainly, you know, taxes uh, pay for our roads and the improvements of our roads, which actually go to the efficiency of our roads. So it's, it's probably a good thing for us to continue to pay those taxes. Uh, and we should do that in the future. In fact, uh, even with electric vehicles, I think uh, it will be important for electric vehicles to carry their share of the burden for improving in, uh, roads because uh, when we use roads, we, uh, we actually wear them out and they have to be rebuilt. I hope that answers the question. All right, Ed, thank you. And for our next person who's gonna be speaking, um, we have Aaron up, Aaron. Um, I, uh, I originally uh, like wrote a long speech of what I wanted to talk about today, but I reconsidered because I, when I saw the beginning of the of this this morning, um, I really wanted to embrace the like conversational style more than anything because I think it's really important that we are really putting this the topic of climate change and climate justice through the lens of like actual people that are around us, not just this thought of the seven billion people and this whole planet, but the people who are actually near you. Um, it's, it's very important. Um, as far as that, uh, one thing that was brought up earlier is uh, the issue of political polarization that we live in right now with uh, social media and uh, how it can be quite a challenge. Um, there is uh, a lot of 
a lot of problems there. And I think um, with uh, climate change and environmental activism, you can do a lot with reframing and re shifting your perspective to actually adjust the, the need to embrace any sort of polarization at all. Um, what I mean is like, you don't have to convince people that they should um, care about climate change. You can actually convince them using other ideas that green technology and these other like behavioral changes you can make um, su are supporting. Uh, so as uh, Chen Wei was talking about with the solar panels, how it ha does have this return on investment, literally from a financial standpoint, we don't have the exact numbers, of course, um, but there is a financial return on purchasing solar panels and selling the electricity, right? Um, and that you can use that to uh, prop up this idea that you should have sustainable, uh, you should make a sustainable change um, and you don't need the person to make the change because they care about the planet at all. You can just get them to change because it makes sense for other reasons. Their reasons in particular is what's important to consider. You need to consider um, who you're selling to, right? Selling the idea of making a change and how, like, you have to give them their reasons to make it um, the right choice. Uh, another one is, uh, there, um, for years, I heard about um, how it is very good for the environment to go and change, um, to live a, and eat a vegan diet. And that is true. I've seen a lot about it. Um, but I never made any change about my lifestyle at all, even though I'd been hearing about it for years. It wasn't until I did a lot more, um, I learned a lot more about the exact um, health benefits completely separate from the issue of climate change, that I actually took action myself and changed my lifestyle, right? And that is a very powerful tool that I don't think um, a lot of the climate change rhetoric or organizations are really um, using to their advantage, that we can really tailor our message um, to actually capture people who don't, in a way that they don't even have to care whether the planet is going to be um, whether the global warming issue of above two degrees Celsius is going to be a problem in 50 years. You don't have to get somebody convinced that they should care about that now if you give them other reasons that they can see in their life today. Um, uh, but I do think it's, it's just as important, again, to really talk about it to people on an individual level. So when you are considering um, how you would do more or convince others maybe to benefit or make choices that benefit um, the climate for the future, uh, you should really do it by talking to them in person or calling them yourself and dedicate your time when you ask them to spend their time. Um, to just post about it on social media alone is, it has a very limited um, possibility of how, that, how deep it goes. It, it has a, a wide audience, but the amount it affects that audience can be pretty limited um, individually. And you really need to get right to the heart sometimes if you want people to really make changes. So you have to talk to them yourself. Um, thank you for uh, letting me be here today. Uh. So, Aaron. And Aaron, thank you for being on the panel as a Pima Community College student with your passionate plea as well. So, Scott, I would like you to talk about your thoughts on this topic. Uh, thank you, Emily. Um, hello, everybody. I am a physics instructor here at Pima Community College, and I teach a course on electricity and magnetism, not donuts. You can go back one. We'll get to that. This is a required course for all engineering students, and we do a lot of problems, and my panel here is to tell you a little story about what I do to get them interested in one of their problems, and the topic is fusion confinement. You can stay on that for a little while. <laughs> 
And I may have gotten a little ambitious on my presentation PowerPoint, and so Noah's clicking away. Uh, fusion confinement, also known as nuclear fusion. And I want to make something clear right at the outstart. This is not Fukushima, Three Mile Island, and Chernobyl that you hear about. This is a completely different thing. And in fact, that's why I've chosen to call it fusion confinement rather than nuclear fusion. This is uh, a source of energy which is not being used yet. It is in the research stages. And the real question is, could this be a solution to our world energy needs? Now we can go to the slide. <laughs> uh, quick science lesson. Think back to when you learned about matter. Matter is made of tiny little particles. You probably learned from one of your physics teachers to think about ice, water, and water vapor. As we heat ice and heat water, we change its phase. We can turn it into a gas. I want to talk about one more level up, which is a plasma. So think of a hot soup of all these particles, very hot, some of them which are charged. This is what we use for nuclear fusion energy. The problem is, it is so hot, we have to figure out how to contain it. A donut. Yes, we can contain it in a donut-shaped magnetic field. Go ahead, click, and see what happens here. All right. So students in my course have to solve a problem where they are given a shape called a toroid, which is more known as a donut, and we wrap a coil of wire around that donut like you see in the picture, and if we put current through that wire, we create a magnetic field in that donut. And so that sounds like maybe something that's a little bit dry to compute the magnetic field inside that donut-shaped object. So what I do is I include a video about this extremely large research experiment in France called uh, the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, ITER for short. Uh, you could click again. And here's a picture of a apparatus, which you can see in the middle there. It looks like a donut. And it is, in fact, a donut that is creating a magnetic field very similar to the problems my students have to solve. And so I show this fun little video. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated than the problem that we do in class, but it's a first step. And I feel that uh, it's interesting when I show them this video and I pose this question. This is research that's happening. It is not energy that we use yet. Could it be a possible solution to the world energy needs? Thank you very much. All righty, thank you, Scott. I'm curious how many people want donuts now. Um, so first, I'd like to check in and see if there's any questions from the audience, either online or here. Noah? Yeah, I have a question for Scott. Just to point out to everyone that a donut is the same shape as a bicycle wheel. It's probably not a coincidence. But so one of the underappreciated alternatives to fossil fuels is nuclear energy. One of the big downsides is it takes a really long time, decades, to build a traditional nuclear power plant, as much as 20 years. There's a lot of permitting and analysis even before you build, you know, dig the first hole. Do you know what the status is of timeline of constructing smaller scale, room-sized nuclear generation power facilities, um, and is it is it a viable alternative in terms of scaling to the needs of big cities? Uh, and I will assume you're talking of conventional nuclear energy that we currently use. Yes. I do not know the answer to that question. Uh, I have heard, though, that fusion is uh, being researched on a smaller scale. So this, what we talked about, this which is not currently being used, uh, this happens to be this experiment that I show my students, uh, the largest uh, toroid reactor. Uh, but there's dozens in different parts of the world. There are also non-donut shaped ones. Uh, and then here in the United States, um, I forget the university that is doing research to have smaller fusion type, this non-conventional nuclear reactors, uh, which can be built more quickly uh, where we can build them more cheaply 
and have more of them. Again, still in the research phases. So I don't know if anybody in the room can answer to your question about conventional current nuclear energy and whether we're able to build them on the small scale. Okay. So interesting factoid. I grew up with my father working at a nuclear power plant, uh, which was about five miles away from where we lived. That was fission energy. And we have a question, what is fusion energy? And so I'm gonna actually ask if Scott could describe both. Uh, yes, now that I can do. So fission, the conventional nuclear energy that we use today in nuclear power plants, uh, takes the nucleus of atoms and it breaks it apart and that will give us energy. Uh, that requires a very large atom and uranium is one of the materials used in fission and we have to mine that, we have that here on Earth. Uh, fusion, on the other hand, the thing in the donut that I was talking about, is taking very small nuclei and fusing them together. So we also get energy if we can put those small nuclei together. So it sounds a little bit odd because doing the opposite thing both gives us energy. That's a little more complicated than we want to get into now, but it does work that way. Um, that, luckily, can be found in seawater. Uh, the material that we can use to get those small nuclei, uh, it's what's happening on the sun right now. And uh, so the, the one trick that this experiment is trying to figure out if it will work is um, to make a breeding blanket uh, for the one uh, nuclei that we don't have available on Earth. So they'll start the reaction, and then as it goes, it starts producing its own fuel, uh, and then the other portion or other component of the field will come from seawater, which is readily available. Thank you, Scott. So we are going to present a few questions of our own to the panel as well. And I'm going to let Nick ask her first question of you. So we're opening this up to the panel. So whoever feels like answering, um, my question to you guys is, what are you most hopeful about in terms of addressing climate change currently? So I'm, I'm actually quite hopeful. Um, I believe that we actually have much of the technology that we need to solve this problem. Um, what we uh, don't have is the political will, and we don't have the process from getting for, for getting from here to where we want to be fast enough. As uh, we've talked about earlier, we really need to reduce our uh, emissions by about 50 percent in the next 10 years, and then we need to take that to zero by 2050 in order to keep global average temperatures uh, down to around 2 degrees centigrade. So the real challenge for us is, um, uh, is trying to, to make that process work faster. There is some, also some good news. Uh, it was felt that if, um, uh, if, it was, um, if we stopped emitting carbon dioxide tomorrow, that it would be some time before we saw a reduction in the increase in warming. Uh, the latest scientific data suggests at this point that if we were to stop producing CO2 tomorrow, that the increase in warming would stop in about four years. That's really hopeful. That's something we can all look forward to and gives us, I think, greater incentives to try to get this problem solved. Uh, so I, I would agree with everything that uh, Ed shared and add that I'm, I'm very hopeful about the passion that the younger generations are really bringing to these problems. Um, the Office of Sustainability employs between 20 and 25 students each year focused on compost cats, the garden, the things that I sort of discussed earlier. Um, but there is uh, a large pool of students at the university and certainly here at Pima and you know across the nation that are not only interested and um, aware of the risks that are being shouldered onto their generations, but are really interested in doing things about it. So. Um, everything that we've seen uh, with the Youth Climate Coalition, um, Greta Thunberg, others, they're really going out and pushing people and decision makers to do things. And those decision makers might always 
rarely um, move at the speed that is really necessary for us to address the climate crisis and other issues therein. Um, but they are tomorrow's leaders. And so it's really exciting. And um, I have a lot of hope that tomorrow's leaders are doing the things and building the groundwork uh, for us to really solve these problems moving forward. Will we move quickly enough is you know, an open question and one that I certainly cannot answer. Um, but I'm very hopeful because of the interest uh, that younger generations are taking in this. And quite frankly, you know, uh, today's decision makers are starting to move a little bit more uh, than they have certainly in the last 10 or 20 years, especially at the corporate level uh, and in the commercial side of things. Um, and that is promising. Again, is it quickly enough? Not at the moment, um, but I have a lot of hope that that will start to accelerate as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I was going to say I am hopeful that um, and at this table we have um, the new organization, right? Or Ed over. I'm sorry, Trevor from the the Pima organization and uh, the University of Arizona for sustainability, right? Um, that like Shen Wei's ideas here about the um, the solar panels in the West Campus, um, while they may not be as he doesn't have the answers about this return on investment and things like this, and that's going to also be for other projects that when people consider things like this themselves, um, that there is a lot of cooperation for people to remember they should bring them to Trevor and that he can start to figure out or they can start to figure out what, um, like what's the process for figuring out how plausible this is and how, like, how we can get there. What's the path? Um, but. Either Chen Wei or Scott. Otherwise, I have another question. OK. So I believe this question is for Ed. However, anyone is open to speak to it. What do you think is the tipping point for the push for electric vehicles now as opposed to, say, 10, 15, or even 20 years ago? So what is the difference from now? 10, 15, or 20 years ago for the push for electric vehicles? Well, you know, I, I think um, it, it depends on where you live and what you use your vehicle for. So my wife and I have a, a little Prius Prime. It only gets 35 miles on a charge. That's plenty for commuting around Tucson. Uh, we haven't bought gas for that car in months. On the other hand, if you want to drive to Florida, it's a hybrid, so it'll convert over to gas. So folks who live um, out, on, out in the West uh, are a little more quick to get range anxiety when it comes to, um, uh, to electric cars. But we're very rapidly seeing electric cars that are approaching 350 to 400 miles per charge, and perhaps more importantly, being able to recharge in between 15 and 20 minutes. So that is really making them actually to the point that they're better than fossil fuel combustion cars because they have lower cost of ownership. You can use them just like a fossil fuel car. You can go 400, 350, 400 miles on a charge or on a tank. Uh, and so I think, um, uh, I think we're starting to see really large leaps in our ability to, to get this done. And a small increase in the energy density of batteries, factor of 1.5, would change everything. It would change everything for these cars. Suddenly, they'd be getting 600 miles on a charge. And uh, they'd be much better than a fossil fuel car. Anyone else like to speak to that question as well? Uh, the way that I see this is I actually, the way I was talking about the dual purpose of what we need to get people to adopt these um, environmentally friendly actions to actually get enough change to increase the amount of change that is happening. Because change is happening to get us more sustainable. But the question, as Trevor said in his talk, is that is this enough change, right? That is the question nobody knows the answer to. And we kind of need to just remember, we need to just do as much as we can. And uh, so when you tie in the purpose of electric vehicles where this like have this really nice climate benefit, but the fact that there's this company, Tesla, who came out with a luxury nice car that is like something that you can see is a luxury item that attracts people to it 
who would normally buy the engine that roars because that's the luxury. And so it, they're pulling people in because the car isn't just electric or and is cheap because it has like 140 miles per gallon for the 2021 Tesla, right? They're not just pulling people in with that. They're pulling people in because it's moderately priced. It's not gouged on the price. And it feels like a luxury car when you're in it, when you drive it. And so it, it makes sense to me why they would start to see electric vehicles more reasonable. Plus, there is a lot of the fact that you have different charging needs, like the actual components. You can't just plug into the wall socket here, right? It has a lot, it's a lot more complicated than that, especially if you want it to charge in the speed that Ed mentioned. Um, and so the, the fact that those got installed a lot recently means that people who live near them will be more likely generally, once they have the need for a new car, to consider an electric vehicle. Yeah, I'd like to add that, see, the first, well, commercial electric car was made by General Motors back in the 80s, but that did not work out back then because, well, you can say the battery wasn't, technology wasn't that good, electronic technology wasn't that good, but the reason I think it failed is because, see, back then, you still rely on the grid to, uh, to charge the battery in that electric car. So people said, well, okay, the electric power company, how, they're, how are they getting their electricity? They're burning coal. And the emission of you know, the electric power company, they're worse than the emission standard for cars. So either you pollute out of the smokestack or you pollute out of the tailpipe. So which one is, you know, you're still polluting, so which one is worse? Well, if you're polluting out of the smokestack, well, that was, that was even worse because you're using coal. But nowadays, see, it's better in that the electric power company, they're using less coal. They're using more solar, more, you know, uh, natural, well, other, like hydro and so on, right? So. Um, so people, I think, feel that, yeah, this works. Now it's better in that you're not completely using coal. And if, you're, if you have solar, well, that's even the best because you're not going through another phase of converting one form of energy to another form of energy. Okay. So I think that's why nowadays people accept I think electric cars. Yeah. Sorry, just to expand upon that. Um, there's also... When I, when I brought up that it's 140 miles per gallon, right? How do you compare a gallon to a gas car, right? How is that efficiency compared? That's the raw energy content converted to electricity of one gallon of gas. And so while even at that time in the 80s, that may have been like an issue, one, we need to do a good job of communicating that the efficiency is so drastically higher that even if, you know, we stopped moving our power grid in, in Arizona towards sustainability, it still would be more sustainable just with an electric car because they are so much more efficient. All right, we are going to wrap up with one question. And this final question is I asking for one word regarding your thought for today's event. If you really go to three, I'll let you have three, but it's supposed to be one word wrapping up your thoughts regarding today's event. Trevor? Um, we'll go with transformation. Transformational. Inspiring. Inspiring, good words. I say exciting. Exciting, another good word. Courageous. Courageous. Community. Community. So transformational, exciting, inspiring, courageous, and community. I think that's an excellent way to summarize today's event. And I'd like to thank the panelists one more time. I'm just going to close for us real quickly. My one word is lunchtime. <laughs> or donut. I don't know, <laughs> one of those. Uh, so just to wrap up, three, three things to say. Uh, first one is thank you to the panelists, moderators, 
audience members for taking your time for being here. Um, second is thank you to the folks who helped put this event on. I did a quick count on my fingers and came up with 13 people who in some way or another have contributed to making this happen, and I've probably missed some, so 15 is probably the right number. And the third thing is, is as the chancellor discussed at the very beginning, this event grew out of the climate action plan that the college is building right now. And that's a long-term thing. That is a 10-year process. And so this is not the last event like this. We anticipate having similar things, larger, smaller, over the coming years. Uh, and so you'll be hearing from us again. So thank you. Have a good day. See you later.